I'm I'm here with the Alexei Koshenko, not just Alexei Koshenko, but the Alexei Koshenko. Hello. <laughs> and he's going to. What are you going to do exactly? You're gonna uh, tell us a bit about all of these flutes because there are so many flutes. They're so gorgeous. Yes. Well, that's that's a, a part of my collection, uh, which also includes some flutes that I borrowed from friends. And uh, of course, it could be much more complete, much more diversified. However, it gives a, a sort of an idea about the evolution of the flute from the Renaissance till the modern flute. With I some, see. some large flutes here. Oh, yeah. And uh, also, well, I just put a Baroque piccolo, but we'll talk about it later. And, um, and you told me they're in a chronological order. Yes, I really, I will try to put them as much as possible in chrono uh, representative chronological order. Um, so, well, first of all, for the oldest flute, it's mainly copies because originals are rare, precious, often in bad state yes, or in Christ. museums. Uh, and in later instruments, you have mainly original all the way till the modern flute. But what is interested, interesting in putting them in chronological order is that uh, you might be surprised uh, by actually how the evolution is not as um, radical as you might expect. So let's start here. We, we are in the Renaissance era, so in the late 15th and 16th century. And we have very, very, very simple instruments which are cylindrical. And from this moment on, uh, at the end of the 17th century, the flutes are going to be almost only conical. Yeah. Until Theobald Böhm will rethink completely the, the uh, flute making and make some... Uh, here I have one, and here, and here, those two being cylindrical flutes. But all the others are conical. So what I want to say is that, you know, we went from cylindrical to conical and then cylindrical yeah, back to again, cylindrical, yeah. uh, which is an interesting uh, point of the of the history. So the the Renaissance flute is among the simplest instruments. It is fascinating actually to see how sweet the sound, but also uh, you can't you can't have a complete chromatic scale on such an instrument, but you have a surprisingly uh, wide range. Um, the, the, the Renaissance flute was played often in families with a, a higher flute, which we, we can call alto, and the tenor flute is that. Sorry, the tenor flute is that one. You have also uh, larger flutes, the bass flutes, um, and they were played in concert in families for four-part music, which was often borrowed from uh, vocal music songs or yeah. dance music, and. Well, of course, as you can guess, the tenor flute was the base for the development of the entire family. Mm -hmm. So it's a very simple instrument. A cylindrical bore, one hole for the embouchure, and six holes for the six, finger, six fingers of my, yes. both my hands. Uh, and there's a cork inside, which you don't see. Oh, okay. So uh, I mean, it's inside, but it's deep, so... It's is there also a cork in um, the other one? Yes, of course, there's a cork, oh, because yeah. otherwise the, the, the wind would go side, uh, both ways, and it has to to be taken on Oh, yes, direction. I know, but it's, it's an actual cork, it's not just that it's cut. No, 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 it's uh, it's an actual cork. Okay. So, maybe I'll play a few sounds on, of the, course. Canvas, on the flute. Please do. With a song by uh, Claudine Cernizzi. And it has a wide range, actually, where the... Okay. Yeah, yeah. This instrument actually is not entirely chromatic for a simple reason: is that you you, you miss actually the possibility to have a, a, a reliable D sharp or E flat. So the lowest note is D, 
please uh, keep in mind that the pitch of all these instruments might be very different. We have this flute is in 440, yeah. but you have much many flutes will be in a lower pitch and a few will be even in a higher pitch. Than okay. One, one pitch. So that's the D. And if I play a chromatic scale, you can see how the, the D sharp have, having to to be fingered with a, with a half hole is extremely weak and almost new, not usable. Mm. However, this instrument will be extremely popular uh, in, the, in, in the 16th century and, and way into the 17th century. Uh, at the end, well, actually, yeah, toward the, the, the third third of the 17th century, French makers will undertake radical changes in the, in the flute making and f what you will guess first is the foot is divided in three pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, what you don't see at first is that the flute is actually has become conical. conical. Yes. And it has one key. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. So now the lowest note of the foot being still D. And now it's pitched a whole tone lower. Uh -huh. Because the pitch was very diversified also within the same era. Depending if you would play uh, what, I mean, depends what type of music you play. It could be, it could be the open air music for the ceremonies, for example, with a loud and high pitch instrument, and indoors music was played with a softer, more delicate and low pitch instrument. Such as the transverse flute one, is, it appears like this in the late 70s of the 17th century, transformed by the Autotère family, so that's a copy of the Autotère, you recognize the uh, Louis XIV ornament. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a beautiful instrument. And low pitch, so it gives it a very low and warm sound. That's D. Mm -hmm. So now you can see that we have a complete chromatic scale, although it has the very uh, uneven tones depending if you play because it, it's based actually the scale is based on D, based on D major very easy hmm. and if every note which is outside the D major scale is produced through artificial fingerings that we call fork fingerings with an open hole in between I see holes. yes and it's actually cheating with the harmonics to obtain these these, these notes, and they're often more veiled, more delicate. Uh, so we have a flute here, which is around 1700 and 1710. That's a copy after Viper, quite similar, uh, in three parts. I'll let you hear the sound with a bit of couperin music. And the flute is uh, liked mostly for his low register. Um, and actually, by being conical, the, the paradoxal uh, thing is that it has reduced the range of the flute compared to the Renaissance one. Mm. Uh, and now you, it actually... And it, won't, it will hardly go higher, for now. Later flutes will develop the high register to make it brighter. Here, uh, all those flutes were copies, and here I have uh, actually uh, quite uh, unusual original flute made of oh, uh, made of uh, plum tree, uh, as, and that flute, as you can see, is in four parts now. Mm -hmm. uh, four parts flutes appeared in the 1720s, and probably that instrument is dating back from 1720. Oh wow! Um, I was quite lucky to purchase it, and it, it has also very good uh, playing properties.
the time of uh, the early time of Blavé, of uh, Bois Mortier, so, so fr early French music. Why four pieces? Because actually, first of all, it was easier to put it in three in the pocket. Yeah. Um, also, probably for making a conical bore, it was easier to have shorter pieces of wood, but especially that flutes were made with several middle left hand joints in different lengths in order to adapt the pitch of the flute according to where you would go when you travel and that in a neighbor city oh i see that's or really interesting country the pitch will be different wow i will show you after a later flute with a, what we call corps de rechange here is a little bit later instrument uh, made after quartz uh, and quartz was uh, so made these uh, loud and male uh, flutes with a large bore with two keys. That's uh, something which the other flutes have only one key so far in the 18th century. And the second key is not helping anything for virtuosity, but mm. for the for the, the pitch. It's also a low pitch, so be one tone below the, the, the modern pitch. <laughs> That's G major. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the people having a, a, <laughs> perfect a, a, a pitch. Perfect pitch. Perfect pitch being actually an, uh, uh, also being trained to hear in 440, um, and that gives a very low and very serious uh, tone, which I love. Mm -hmm. So if you think of an For example, mm -hmm. and why two keys? Because once, like many uh, people in the 18th century, thought that it was very important to make a distinction between the E flat and the D sharp, which is one. Uh -huh. one. D and D sharp and D and E flat now. I see. You know it's very subtle difference. Uh, I like to show that to to explain that sometimes we might think that in the 18th century with such simple instrument people did not play so well in tune. <laughs> I actually think that maybe they played much better in tune than now, or actually we had much more accurate. It makes sense. Because they were not playing with a tuning machine on the on the uh, in front of them, and they were not using a lot of vibrato, which is actually taking the pitch all about. Yeah, <laughs> but thinking about the this the importance of this one comma uh, tells a lot about also the the, the very accurate listening that they, that they had in that time. Here is a thinner later instrument made after Thomas Lott and uh, it has a beautiful engraved key but it's a copy uh, engraved keys where actually you can see it also on the nape of flute oh, yeah. another engraved key very beautiful but that's just purely decoration uh, with boxwood because you see a variety of woods and the black woods are usually ebony and most flutes were made of out of ebony or boxwood European boxwood or ivory uh -huh. Um, and that's a flute after Thomas Lott, which is very representative of uh, what Michel Blavet has played for Rameau operas, for example. And Thomas Lott is actually from the family of the later Louis Lott. Mm -hmm. uh, that was already a great family of French uh, flute makers. Here is a it's still later instrument from, uh, say, 1750 or 60, uh, made after an Italian maker called Carlo Palanca. Mm -hmm. uh, and here, still one key flute. It seems very, very similar to the to the other ones, yes. apart from the color. So still one key flute. However, this one made by Grenzer in the 1780s of the 18th century, we would enter. Not anymore. We are not anymore in the bar what we call the Baroque era because we, we we want to make categories. Of course, in that time they didn't make categories, but now mm. we do, and that's more of a classical flute. Uh, 1780, so we are in the lifetime of Mozart, and this one as well, and that's actually quite interesting because here you will see two uh, stops 
of development, but both are made after the same maker, uh -huh. who is uh, Heinrich Grenzer. And Grenzer made s simple flutes with one key, but also the kind of new development, which was to have flutes with here eight keys, but it could as well be six or five or four. Why the extra keys? Uh, well, before now I will play both flutes. On both flutes I will play a chromatic scale. Okay. So keep in mind it's the same model, made by the same maker. With we are in the time of Mozart, so now uh, I will play D major scale in 430, which is a much higher pitch, closer to the model pitch. So you get used to. And the chromatic scale, if I emphasize the the good notes and the bad notes. Okay. <laughs> So you can hear that some are weaker than others. Mm -hmm. I exaggerate a little bit, but it's close to the truth. And the instruments, compared to the uh, earlier flutes, so we are now at the end of the 18th century, you can hear it's brighter. It's higher, yes. it goes here easier in the third register. Now we're back with a, with a classical flute. So you heard uh, a chromatic scale with a one key flute. And now the addition of the extra keys, which appeared in the 1860s in England first, uh, but then where we get, became popular in Germany and later in France. France was a little bit old-fashioned for a while. Um, and it allows each semitone of the, of the scale to have its own hole. So you don't have to use the four fingerings anymore. And instead of having, if I don't use the keys, so I play it like the other one. <laughs> Now, ah. it's more equal. Yes. And it, you can hear the difference in the G sharp, which is the weakest note. Oh yeah, it's huge. And it's also easier to play chromatic scale. For example, well, with a bit of practice. Um, so Mozart, in his lifetime, has now both types of instruments. Uh -huh. And actually, soloists they like more the simple instrument because it was more for orchestral use that it was important to have the possibility to sustain strong notes on every semitone, like the other woodwinds. But most of the solo repertoire that we know by Mozart is really written for, for the one key flutes. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, think of the concertos or the... the um, it's based on D major. And if you think that the concertos are in D major and G major and mm -hmm. so are the, 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 the quartets, the most popular quartets. And the, f the, the, the furthest we go from, away from D major with adding sharps or adding flats, the more difficult it is. Yeah. But and all this kind of thing. Um, for keys actually for most of this music. So the, the flute with eight keys became very popular bef before 1900 in Germany and uh, and during 20 or 30 next years that's a, a more or less standard model that we, we will have uh, and uh, if you think of Beethoven symphonies they, they were played on such instruments. Mm -hmm. um, Wonderful.
default syncretic. Next to it, you have a little bit later instrument. That's, it looks tiny because it goes only to low D and not to the low C. And it's also very delicate. It's the, one of my favorite instruments. It's made by Bellisson in Paris. Uh, so it's typical French flute with a tiny embouchure hole oval. Yes. Um, and beautiful keyworks. So that's an original. The previous one was a copy. That's an oh, original. Wow. And that's a flute which was made in 1830, approximately. I don't have the exact date, but 1830. 1830 is the date of. In Paris, is the date of the Symphonie Fantastique by Berlioz uh -huh. and Wilhelm Tell. Yes. Imagine Berlioz's Symphonie Fantastique, such a modern music, such a daring music, played on a six keys flute. That's actually amazing. It is. And, and I think it's also, that's why, why I like to play on period instruments, is because it makes the, mo the music appear so much modern. It's like, you have the, the score of Berlioz, you have that instrument in your hands, you think like, what? He dared to write that type of music and these amazing new things and modern things for yes. that instrument. And of course, that we also inspire that the instruments have to, well, to go one step further because the composer is so modern mm -hmm. in thinking that it has to, well, he reached the limit of the instrument. But that's a wonderful instrument. And for the trill on the high D, actually you need an extra key which is missing here, but which is on some flutes of the time. Mm. And that flute came, actually, I was lucky to buy it with two left hand joints. Ah. You see, one is longer than yes. the other. Because in Paris, two pitches were in use. Depending if you were playing in the great opera, yeah. Or in the Opéra des Italiens, which was the, co uh, the Opéra Comique, where Italian composers would perform their pieces, where they used to, p to perform higher. Aha, uh -huh. that's interesting. Uh, yeah, and that flute worked wonderfully in, uh, in, in both from the low D to even high. <laughs> without too many problems. Mm -hmm. And think about the music of uh, Toulouse and Demersman being played on such instruments. That's a German instrument, a little bit later, from the Mendelssohn and Schumann time. So, if you think, uh, Schubert, Mendelssohn, Schumann were played on that, huh? And the low B is actually a very early invention. Oh, yes, I was going to ask that, actually. Yeah, but think, you know, you all know that, uh, that Schubert uh, variations, they have yes. low Bs. Yes. Huh? And that's a flute from that time. Um, so that flute has a little bit more keys because it goes low and uh, also extra keys for the for the uh, for the trills. And now we are coming to in French instruments, the two French instruments here are both made by Godefroy. And we are reaching actually that moment that Theobald Bum was making new experiments Yes. Um, and has actually thought over the mechanism of the flute completely. And we, although these flutes are, Fran these flutes are both French, they represent the, the arrival of the bum system in, in France. And that one is Godefroy from 1838. Um, and actually, you know, bum was not so successful in Germany. No. And in France, he was very quickly successful. Despite Toulouse, the main flute player and teacher, uh, was uh, so influent, and he was playing the old, the old system, that actually there was a resistance against the, 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 the bone oh, flute. But some players were really interested by it. And as soon as Toulouse retired from the conservatory in 1860, then he was replaced definitely by a bone flute player. Um, so that's a conical first system, the 1837 um, system. 
That's a high pitch instrument. Lovely. And that's another Godefroy made a little bit 10 years later with for open instance, holes. Uh, that's, a, that's a cylindrical uh, instrument. Yeah. And that's the second uh, 1847 uh, bomb system, which is actually the, the base for the modern flute. And about that time, actually, play, uh, uh, French makers like Godefroy himself, but also uh, uh, his uh, apprentice Louis Lot, started to make also uh, silver flutes. And you have here some uh, early silver flutes, and already they could be all, almost contemporary, although that one was made in 1879, I think. I see. Uh, so I placed it a little bit further. But already you have, you have the first silver flutes. So you might be surprised to see so many simple system instruments later. Yeah. Because in Germany, as I was saying, in Germany and, uh, and uh, 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 also Central Europe uh, countries, the bomb system was actually not really enjoyed. They thought it was too radical a plunge mm. and it was betraying the, the properties of the true beautiful flute plane. So here you have uh, an amazing flute made by, made by uh, Meyer in uh, Hanover in 1855. And about the same time, that's a Tigler flute, uh, which is identical to what the Doppler brothers were playing. And here is a Louis Lot. And that flute has a history. It belongs to my dear friend uh, Bernard Duplex. And that flute was actually belonging to Johannes Donjon, whom you might know from here for yes. his, uh, uh, some of his flute pieces. Uh, so we know, we know it because we know the, the number of the flute. We know that he purchased it. And, uh, and the flute comes from his family with a beautiful embouchure guilloché, which is... Uh, Actually, it's a very delightful sensation of the lips, and uh, sometimes it also avoids the foot uh, to slip. Uh, to slip, exactly. I see. Um, and that's beautiful, and I can play a bit of donjon's music on it. Mm. It's a very warm, very, very suave and uh, delicate. And here, uh, well, I'm telling you about the instrument for Doppler, and maybe not many flute players are aware that if although Doppler's music is so virtuous, or it was not played on bomb system, hmm. and uh, that one needs to be to, to have the pads changed. But I have a, I have another one by the same maker, and uh, just to show you that some well-known places of the fantasy past on Hongroise. seems to be very virtuoso, it actually <laughs> really fits perfectly well the fingers for this type of instrument wow. that they knew perfectly, of course. And uh, you can see on the later uh, instrument that there was still some resistance for against the bump system. Yeah. Um, and you, you can see that the, 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 the boxwood is little after little is abandoned because it tends to to move, you know, I see. and uh, when you have long keys and a delicate key wheel that has to to close perfectly, that becomes uh, a little bit of a problem. So the harder woods like uh, Grenadilla were used, and also the ivory uh, head joints were very much. You know, and, and the thing that you can also you know, see sometimes the making beautiful. Yeah. 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 Yeah
one end and then the, the other. Those are extremely heavy, uh, solid but reliable instruments and that goes, they go very low. Uh, that one goes till uh, down to, to low B flat, uh -huh. but some who could go even lower to a low uh, A, G, uh, a G? and sometimes to the low G because the idea was to to have the possibility to, to play as low as the violin. Ah, of course, okay. Beautiful. Yes. Mm, so that's, uh, that's a later instrument by uh, uh, Timiman in Leipzig. And here you have also an, uh, a, a bum flute. As you can see, it's a very massive cylindrical bum flute from the Czech Republic mm -hmm. around uh, 1900 or a little bit before, mm -hmm. which I used to play uh, Rimsky Korsakov, for example, Shehazade. And after 1900, there were still some people reluctant to play on the bum system. Uh -huh. Believe it still. Or not. And actually, even yeah, and even very uh, very influent people, such as uh, Maximilian Schwedler, who was principal flute player in the Gewandhaus in Leipzig, and he was very much into the tradition of the old system flute. And he designed, he was first playing this type of instrument, but then he designed this flute together with Kruspe, uh, uh well-known instrument maker. Um, which actually retains most of the fingerings of the old system flute. It's still conical, still made of wood, and you can play it almost like a baroque flute. You can play it like, like this type of instrument. Wow. Uh, but it has extra keys and it makes also all notes equally stronger, uh, strong. Uh, you can play some fingerings like the bum flute, uh, like the open C sharp, which works very well. And to give you an idea, that instrument, as it was played by Maxi Wilhelm Schwedler, who was uh, at the, the, the Reinecke Flute Concerto in 1910, uh, or 1908, and the, the ballad in 1910 were dedicated to Schwedler, who played oh, such instrument. And despite it looks I don't know, it's a matter of taste how it looks, <laughs> but, but I love the sound of the instrument and it's very impressive. So I find it very ugly looking, but it, in the <laughs> response, it's uh, uh, it, it's it's excellent and it's sonorous, it's deep and warm, uh, and that's a typical example of instruments played in Germany in the eight, in the nineteen twenties and thirties. As you can see, that the wood was still the norm, um, and uh, despite they they started to use uh, metal head, metal head joints, yeah. I, I don't know about the reason for the metal head joints, but maybe it was to avoid the cracks. Mm. Uh, maybe not on, only, but you see that they, they still liked it more uh, to be wooden. And at the end of the chain, you have my modern flute, which is uh, made by Parmenon, uh, who is the... Actually, I think at the, at the moment, the only Italian artisanal uh, French flute maker. Uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful instrument, it's called Métis, it's half gold and half uh, silver. And uh, just three words about the biggest flute. So there's a bass flute here, who belongs oh, yes. to a very, very dear <laughs> friend of mine. <laughs> so uh, which is just uh, uh, for a few days in my home to give me a very special entertainment because I did not <laughs> one. Thank you, Daniela. <laughs> but 
Actually, bass flutes are not a modern invention. They were lower flutes very early, oh. in the 17th and 18th century. And there were already bass flutes in the Baroque era, also with a brass tube here. So that's not a modern invention. Mm. Uh, and there were also some sort of alto flutes, because that's a flauto d'amore, which was used in the beginning of the, uh, of the 18th century. Uh, there's not much flute music for it, uh, but there is some, and it's also a delightful sound. Beautiful. The as well, because the oh, yes. from that with the time. So that's a baroque piccolo. It's a baroque petite flute, hmm. uh, which appeared in France in the in, uh, around 1720, and actually in Fran French operas, uh, especially those by Rameau. Yeah, hear very often the petite flute, and sometimes it can be very delightful and not at, not at all piercing. Very nice. Yes, it's a very beautiful instrument and gives also pastoral uh, uh, evocation uh, and uh, it's used also very much for the tambourin and, the, and lively pieces from the countryside in, uh, in French operas. So, well, you have uh, now this overview of the, the fruit making, the fruit evolution. I hope that was uh, for you interesting. Uh, <laughs> very much so. But the most important is you can see that uh, although the modern instrument is much more sophisticated, but actually all instruments at all time were good for what they had to do. Uh, <laughs> and they were all certainly extremely beautiful, charming, uh, and bring and able to carry a lot of emotions. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs> well, I'm back home now. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. I really do find it so interesting. And uh, he has so many stories and things to say. Usually, like, he could talk for hours and hours, but uh, I think the video was about 30 minutes in total. I don't know of him talking, but um, it went by so quickly. So, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're not subscribed, please do subscribe. And uh, I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.